Hi, I'm Kate. I'm a first year mathematician at Trinity College. Hi, I'm Fareed. I'm a first year mathematician at Trinity College. Hi, I'm Ian. I'm a tutor in applied maths here at Trinity College. Okay, so we've got uh, the dynamic sheet and the PDE sheet. So Kate, that's you. And that's you, Fareed. Thank you. Um, which was some good work. So that we're going to spend most of the time on dynamics because I think it's quite interesting. Yeah, let's look at the, so some of these questions went right and then the last one was not quite right um, from some of you. Oh. So this is all about this constrained motion stuff. So you've got this particle going around in a cone. Mm -hmm. um, and what was the important thing about the normal reaction force? It's perpendicular. That it's normal. Yeah, it's normal. <laughs> yeah, it's normal to the surface. It's perpendicular to so, time. So yeah, you, I think you both said things which are not quite right here. So. Did you mean e, well, I think it's e, theta. Theta, e theta dot yeah. n is zero? Yeah, so you've got this thing, which is a, a cone, and then the reaction force is that way. And you define er this way, and ez that way, and m's that way. So there's, there's, there's got to be two vectors that n is perpendicular to, and mm -hmm. one of them is e theta, which is into the page there. And then what's, what do you use as the other one? Or what's, what else is it perpendicular to? The slope of the cone. Yeah, so it's, it's perpendicular to that direction, um, which is, is useful to think of that as like the tangent mm -hmm. uh, to the cone. Because it's, because obviously it's, it's a plane, locally it's a plane. So you've got e theta direction and, the, and that direction. And But what you'll often use for these questions is that it's the, the direction of the velocity, r dot, Mm -hmm. It's perpendicular to n. Because you know that it's moving on the cone, then you know that the velocity must be perpendicular um, to the normal. So, that, so you use that statement a lot. And that's where you really get the fact that this force doesn't do any work. Right? It's the fact that it's perpendicular to the velocity is why it doesn't do any work. Um, so that, um, and you had to use that uh, when you were showing that the energy was conserved. So, but the first thing that you always do in these questions is to write down this Newton's second law. So uh, when you get stuck with these questions, that's always the starting point. So in this case, you've got gravity, and then you've got this normal reaction. So you would always start with that. Um, and then you should usually be trying to write down what R is, and you want to decide what coordinate system to use. And in this case, you were in cylindrical coordinates, so you were going to do this. Uh, R, E, R, plus Z, E, Z. Um, and then you, you have to differentiate that. Um, mm. So the, the, the first bit was fine, showing that uh, when you dot this with e theta, you get um, zero, because this doesn't have any component in the theta direction, this doesn't have any component in the theta direction, and that tells you that the angular momentum is conserved. Uh, so that's... Yeah, oh yeah, this is, yeah, so this is the same bit as this. So, so this is not true here. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? E yeah. N dot ER is not zero. Um, let me get this, this one. Whenever you say, so you, you talked here about saying I was going to equate components in the different directions. And that is effectively what you're doing, but you should think of it more as taking a dot product. Because taking a dot product is taking the component yeah. in the theta direction. And I think that's the way that you want to try and think about these things. It, you always have to differentiate this and then find all the expressions. And I, I tend to just think it's a good idea to write these down straight away. Because um, you're going to need to use them all through the question. So this one is r double dot minus r theta dot squared. And then you get 1 over r d by dt of r squared theta dot. I just remember that you can write it like that, the theta component, because uh, it's helpful often mm -hmm. to write it like that because of that fact that it, it often means that this quantity, angular momentum, is conserved. Um, so, so that bit was fine. And then it's to explain why the total energy is conserved. Um, and so, as you said, it's, it's because, because the thing is smooth, therefore it doesn't do any work, and that's really because it's perpendicular to the velocity. Um, and I think that you both 
Well, you just argued that was the case, and then you said I can differentiate it and show and that that gets zero. Um, I tend to prefer, there's a, there's two different ways you can think about a lot of these problems because you can either say I'm going to start by saying that energy is conserved, and then I derive mm -hmm. my equation from that, or you can say I'm going to start with Newton's second law, and then I can derive that the energy is conserved, and they're kind of equivalent, and it's a, almost a matter of taste as to which one you say is where you're going to say is your starting point. Um, most of these questions I kind of prefer to say, well, if I've started writing down Newton's second law, I should just use that as my, that's the thing I know is true, and if I'm going to derive anything else, it should come from there. Um, and there's always an easy way to get from Newton's second law to energy. Do you know what that is? How, how can I get to saying what the energy is from that equation? Mm, well, this is equal to force, yeah. which is equal to minus dv by dr or dx. Yeah, if, it's a, if it's energy. a conservative yeah. force, then mm -hmm. we can write it as the gradient of a potential. Mm -hmm. You've done that, yeah? Yes. So let's say like gravity is, can be thought of as the gradient of the potential energy. Um, but do you know how I get to that from this equation? There's a, there's a kind of a trick. Well, it's not really a trick. But, it, but it, you always multiply by the velocity. And because it's a vector equation, multiplying means dotting. So if you dot the equation with r dot, then you get m r double dot dot r dot. There's a lot of dots. <laughs> and they're obviously, they're different. they mean different things. Minus m g e z dot r dot. And then you have n dot r dot. Um, and the reason that you, this, this thing here is the derivative of a half m r dot squared. That's always the case. Does that make sense? Because that r dot squared is r dot dot r dot. And if you <laughs> differentiate that, yeah. you get 2 r dot r dot r double dot. Um, so if you remember that you can always write that as that, that's quite useful. This, of course, is the kinetic energy. Mm -hmm. yeah. right? So this is really the rate of change of the kinetic energy, is r dot times the acceleration. And then this term here, so mgez dot r dot, is just mgz dot. So you can think of that as d by dt of mgz. Mm. So that's the rate of change of mm. the potential energy. And then this term we argue was zero. Yeah. So that's, what, that's kind of why doing dot, the, the dot of this with the velocity is a good thing to do because of the fact that we know that n dot the velocity is zero. Um, and often you, don't, often you don't really care what n is. You kind of want to eliminate mm -hmm. it because that's the whole point. It's, it's just a constraint that's telling us that we're stuck on the cone. Um, but so that you can always derive the energy like this. So, so this just tells us that d by dt of half m r dot squared plus mgz is zero, and so mm -hmm. mg is sense. conserved, but which is exactly what you yeah. did just backwards, um, as you can see. And this also would tell you if if you had a friction force, so if n was not pointed in the normal direction, then this would tell you what the rate of change of energy is due to that friction force. So it actually tell you how much, how quickly you're, in, you're, mm -hmm. you're losing the energy. Um, I don't think we ever actually have to deal with friction, but that would that would come in there. So so often with these things, you you can kind of argue that energy is conserved, but often you don't actually need to do that. You can just derive whether it is or not. Uh, from the equations, and that's kind of relevant to question three, because um, for that one you have to do it this way. Um, so anyway, so you derived that equation, and that was okay. And then there was this showing that the particles between two heights. So you managed to show that you get an expression for z dot squared, and then yeah, I wasn't quite convinced about this. Neither was I. <laughs> <laughs> you did. You did uh, it's well, you kind of manipulated I, yeah, it. Uh, I guess this is why it's in pencil. Yes, it is. But I think something went wrong there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so, w w but what were you trying to argue? Uh, um, I was trying to get. I know that 
the z dot squared needed to be greater than zero, so then I was going to right, get a quadratic with the z. Yeah. That would be. Yeah, so it can't so it can't be quadratic. Oh yeah, got, no a cubic. Yeah, but then I'm going to get three heights. It's got to be a cubic, and so it'll be three heights at which what happens? At which. Um, Z dot is zero. Oh, which Z dot is zero. So the three the three roots of that cubic are places where Z dot is zero, um, and uh, and then it okay. So it didn't work out quite right, but it turns out that one of those heights is negative, and therefore it doesn't really make any sense because that's like mm -hmm. off yeah. the bottom of the cone. Um, so there are two places where Z dot is zero, and then so you then just said it must be the case that it's between those two heights. That wasn't kind of completely obvious to me. Why? If I find places where z dot is zero, how do I know that I hadn't just gone to that height and then kept kept going a bit higher? I could have just like a stationary point doesn't necessarily mean it's a maximum or a minimum. Mm -hmm. So we need to check that. So you, you don't need to check that because you. Um, I guess you could check that. You can find out what z double dot is, but you don't really want to do that because we have to differentiate yeah. all this again. Um, but it, well, it, it's kind of there anyway, because you've got this inequality. So you're saying that a cubic function has to be greater than or equal to zero. And so I think the easiest way to do that is to draw the graph, because I think this cubic thing is going to look something like this, as a function of z. Um, it, has, it has one negative root and it has two positive roots, I think. And and th but this this thing here is, I think it's actually z squared z dot squared because you have to multiply by z squared. Um, somewhere along there was a, there was a one over z squared. Anyway. Um, but this thing's got to be positive, and so you you must have to be in between those two places where it's zero, um, because you you can't you can't possibly go through the zero, because then z dot squared would be negative, which doesn't make any sense. So I think if you if you draw a little graph, um, then you that's clearer to say that they've got to, you've got to be between those two heights. Does that make sense? Yeah. So th and this thing, so actually, what is it? So one of these things must be right. I guess it's this one. Yeah. So it was. Uh, a minus Z. So you, you noticed, I think, that Z equals A is a solution of this. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it, you can forget that. But then the fact that Z equals A is a solution is clear from the initial condition, because yeah. you set it off going horizontally with Z dot equals zero. So, um, and that's quite useful, because if it's a cubic equation, otherwise it might be quite difficult to find all the roots. Um, so th what was the rest of it? So it was. A minus Z, and then it's A minus Z times 2G, and then plus V squared, 1 minus A squared on Z squared. And so that's 2G Z squared a minus z, I put the whole thing on top of z squared, plus v squared, z squared minus a squared. This was 2z dot squared. And so that means that 2z squared, z dot squared, is a minus z, which factors out of everything, times 2g z squared, and then if we factor out a minus z, we get minus v squared a plus z, I think. Is that the same as what you got for age? Yeah, looks like it. And so, yeah, this thing is definitely positive. So this thing has always got to be positive. And this is a negative cubic. So it's basically what I've drawn there. And it's got three solutions. So z equals a and the other two which uh, z is equal to, what was it, v Nothing over... Nothing nice. Uh, yeah, it's just a funny expression. Yeah, this. v plus or minus the square root yeah. of v squared plus h g a. Right, that's just the quadratic formula for the solutions of those. Um, 
and then one of those, so because that's bigger than v squared, so that's the, mm. then the minus one is definitely negative. So the minus one is definitely that root, and then the other one is a positive root. So the z equals a and z equals that one with the plus sign are those two roots. It's not obvious which one's which. Yeah. That depends on v. So if you make v big enough, this one will be big. And if you make v small enough, this one will be close to zero. Um, so these two roots are, are those two roots. And so th that means that when you, if, when you flick this thing around the circle, right, it's not, depending on how fast you flick it, either it's going to go, start going up and go to a higher height and then back down to A again, and, and it's going to do this kind of thing. Or if you flick it slowly enough, it's, A is going to be its highest height and it's going to go down mm -hmm. and then come back up again. And it's going to do this kind of thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Um, and I guess that they're, they're the same when v is equal to g a v v or v squared is g a. I think when v squared is g a, then those two things are the same. So these collide when v squared is equal to a g. What would happen in that case? What would? We would keep the same height. Yeah, so it would just, just go around. It would just yeah. go around in a circle. Exactly. So you, you you'd have chosen exactly the right speed, so that it can just do circular motion. And it doesn't have to go up and down at all. Um, okay, good. Right. So so that's that question. These these kind of question comes up a lot in the exams. So it's uh, uh, it's quite fun. Well, maybe it's not fun. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Th so th then the next question was about this. Um, thing. So, yeah, that's fine. Next question was this thing that's going to roll off the sphere. And you just had to come up with some reasonable explanation as to why it moves on the great circle. It's kind of obvious. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that it's going to, it's going to it's start It's quite difficult putting into words. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things that's straight. really difficult to explain. <laughs> um, I, I mean, it, it's possible that what they wanted you to get out here was about conservation of angular momentum again. Uh, in the sense that if it if it starts rolling off down the sphere, it never has any angular momentum, and angular momentum is conserved. So if it starts off with zero angular momentum, then it can never get any because mm -hmm. because there's no forces going around. Um, but it was also fine just to argue that whichever way it goes, it's then going to be confined to that plane. So if you if you define your x coordinate to be the way that it starts rolling, then you've only ever got any forces in the X direction yeah. and the Z direction, so why is it ever going to move anywhere else? And if it's confined to a plane and a sphere, then, it, great then it's a great circle. In fact, it's kind of the definition. Um, so, I, but anyway, both of your answers there I thought sounded fine uh, to explain that. Um, and then you had to find these equations. So, this bit uh, was good. So here, Kate, I thought um, it was better to try and use vectors rather than, you, you read everything out in Cartesian yeah. components, which kind of works. But usually with these kinds of questions, it's better to try and um, write things in terms of the vectors. And in this question, like e, ER and E theta were useful. Um, and part of the reason for that is that the N, you know N is pointing perpendicular to the sphere. So when, when, when your thing has fallen to here, you know that the n is going to be going that way. So n e r, if I define e r to be going that way. And I think it said it, said it wanted theta to be that angle. Yeah. Um, so e r. Actually, this one's not totally standard which, which way the coordinates are. But so e r in this case was going to be uh, sine theta zero cos theta and then e theta if e theta comes this way uh, it's going to be uh, cos theta zero minus sine theta will be perpendicular um, but I, I, I think it's kind of better to work in terms of those and then you and then you can say that the position of that is r is equal to Actually, because you know it's on the on the sphere, so it's just a e r, and then it's kind of slightly nicer. And then and then you can say, well, r dot 
a is a constant, so that's just a e r dot. And if you do e r dot, you get theta dot e theta. You just to tell you got a sign right because it's not completely. Yeah. This is not the normal. Normally, you have e r going that way and e theta going this way. Um, but also, theta is different. <laughs> so, uh, if, if you, regardless of which way you put, would you always get the same derivatives? So like. E r dot goes to e theta. Yeah, like, but dot, so, theta dot. But but if I made theta go that way, in this case, I would have got uh, uh, e r dot is minus theta dot e theta. So so I could always I could have defined e theta to be going that way. I mean, it wouldn't really make sense to do that because it would not be in the direction of increasing mm -hmm. theta. But you might do that, and it wouldn't it, it wouldn't go wrong. We just have to we just have to keep track Adjust, of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's one of the reasons why it is actually a good idea sometimes to write these down. Yeah. Uh, just because you can check. So I can, I can do it in my head. If I differentiate that with respect to time, I'm going to get cos theta theta dot. And I'm going to get minus sine theta mm. theta dot. Um, uh, so I know that I get theta dot e theta. But if, you, if, you're no, if you're using normal circular coordinates, then you should just remember that that's the case. Uh, I mean, it, it's quite straightforward to derive it, um, and then and then your r double dot in this case, then is the derivative of that. So you get a theta double dot e theta, and then you get theta e theta dot, which is always going to then be minus theta dot e r. So they give you minus a theta dot squared e r, which is what you've got here. Yeah, it's just it's written out. In more components, but the reason, part of the reason why you do that is then your Newton second law is going to be m r double dot is um, minus m g. Uh, let me call it k this time. So k is going that way. Uh, plus n, but you know that n is in the e r direction, so you can immediately write it as n e r scalar n e r. Um, because then when you take components, this is what I'm saying, when taking components, you're really doing dot products. Yeah. And you can do dot products even if you have not written it all out in an orthogonal coordinate system. So I've written r double dot in terms of e theta and er, and gravity is written in terms of k. Mm -hmm. So you might think, well, I need to rewrite k in terms of er and e theta to be consistent. But you don't really need to do that. You can just say, well, I'm just going to take the dot product. So I, I come and say, let's take the dot product with e theta, then I'm going to get m a theta double dot is equal to minus mg, and then I've got k dot e theta, where k dot e theta was sine theta, so this is just mg sine theta, and, and I had plus n e r dot e theta, but that's obviously zero, because they're perpendicular. So that gives you that equation, and then you take the e r component and get the other one. Um, but so Because you had to do a sort of cross-multiplying, you know, to yeah. eliminate the n. Uh, but if you if you've got your coordinates in directions which are suitable for doing that, then mm -hmm. it makes it easier. So this this gives us this gives us minus a theta dot squared is minus m g k dot e r plus n, and that is uh, minus m g cos theta plus n. Right. So that gives you your theta double dot is g over a sine theta. You know that's the equation of the pendulum. Yeah. Um, we, have you done the pendulum in the lectures? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's like this, but upside down. Yeah. <laughs> it's basically the same thing. Uh, minus a theta dot squared. So those are the two things. So if you only cared about how theta changes, then you wouldn't really worry about this equation, because all this equation tells you is what n is. No, no. Yeah. But if you want to know when is it going to leave the surface, then obviously yeah. you need to look at that equation. Um, Right. So, and then for the next part, you, you, I think you both said let's use energy, energy. conservation. Yeah. So this is this again. I kind of think it's a bit. Um, it's almost like you're involving too many things if you now say I'm going to have energy conservation because you've already really got that here. Um, so I, I would prefer to at this point say, well, I've got these two equations. I just need to solve them. Um, because this one really gives you energy conservation. If you multiply that one by theta dot, this is kind of the same idea. If I take this 
and multiply by theta dot, then it will give me conservation of energy. Because theta dot is effectively a velocity again. So th this gives me d by dt of a half theta dot squared is equal to d by dt of so this is the minus same trick as before. Because it's exactly the same thing. And it, because it, that will always give yeah. you uh, energy. Well, it, in fact, it, it, the, the reason why it's sometimes that's helpful to do is because you, sometimes you might not be sure whether energy is conserved or not. And this should tell you. A very quick check. Well, it might not be that quick. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sometimes, if this equation is more complicated, it might take a long time to make it work. Um, I mean, in this case, it was fine just yeah. to say, I know energy is conserved because of the thing is smooth. But it seems, to me, it feels a little bit like, like you're invoking more ingredients than you need. Mm. Yeah. Uh, because you've already really got it here. So, so this tells us that a half theta dot squared plus g over a cos theta is a constant. And we know that when we start, we start at the top with theta dot is zero. And cos theta is one, so that's g over a. And then basically you just had to take that and stick it into there, didn't you? So theta dot squared is g, 2g over a, 1 minus cos theta. And then the cos theta was z over a, this is right. And you plug that into there and it tells you what n is. Um, It doesn't tell you. This doesn't tell you how long it's taken. So, if you wanted to know like, how long did it take for it to get to there, then you would need to actually solve this equation, which we have not quite done here. We found a relationship between theta dot and z, but we've not found uh, what theta is as a function of time yet. Uh, right. So, and then it, it, so it falls off when n is zero, or when, when n apparently goes negative. So what happens after that? It'll fall freely due to gravity. Yeah. So what what kind of path will it follow? And it falls off. Did you do this? What did you do? Like m m two or three or something? I did, but did do not remember. <laughs> so so we we found that it happens at two thirds of z apparently. Uh, sorry, two thirds of a. And I think we're measured yeah. from here, so it's so two thirds of a. It's kind of it's about here, so it falls off, and then it will fall uh, like that. Mm -hmm. And this, what, so which forces are acting on it at that point? Gravity. Just gravity. Just gravity. Yeah. So you, so you'll just have m r double dot is minus mgk, and so it will follow a parabola, because the, the, the x component of its velocity will stay constant, mm -hmm. and the y component, or the z component, um, will be increasing in time. Um, so at least in principle, you could kind of work out where it will hit the ground um, by working out what its velocity is. Well, in fact, we know what its velocity is when it leaves. Because we can work that out from theta dot, it tells us what its velocity is in the theta direction. Um, and then you could carry on and work out what happens. I think the algebra gets a little bit ugly. Um, but in principle, it's quite straightforward. It, w w once it's not on the circle, then it would be a bit crazy to use circular coordinates. So if you actually wanted to do that, then you're best to go back to Cartesian coordinates again and just work in terms of x and, x and z. Um, but if you're writing everything in terms of e's and things, that's not. That's not um, so complicated to do. You can just switch out between them if you want to. Um, if the motion was on like an ellipsoid, would you also use cylindrical coordinates? If it was on an ellipsoid, uh, or a similar round object. That's an interesting question. I might do. Yeah. You, I guess it's different. Yeah, so, it's e, so ER and E theta mm. are not going to be so useful if it's an ellipsoid, because because the point of those here is that ER is perpendicular to the surface and E mm -hmm. theta is tangent. 
and if the thing was elliptical, then um, the sort of equivalent of E R and E theta are not going to be they're not going to be perpendicular to the surface. So if you imagine it's kind of like that, and then the perpendicular direction coming from some origin. So I think that that's not going to be very useful. So in that case, would we just I think use you Cartesian? Might be or... be, it might, might be better to go in Cartesian, yeah. What you might want to do um, is write a lot of stuff in terms of the normal and tangent at each point. Hmm. But they, and, they, and you might parameterize those in terms of some theta. Um, like remember, you can write the equation of the ellipse as like x is equal to a cos theta, y is equal to b sine theta. You can parameterize the surface of the thing in terms of theta. Um, and so you might be useful to use some kind of theta, but then the normal and the tangent directions you'd want to write in terms of, well, you'd have to work out what they are. Uh, and then you'd use those to say, well, I'm going to write down, I'm just going to write down this, because this is true regardless of what coordinate system we then write our double dot in terms of. Mm -hmm. And then we say, let's take, a, let's take the component of that in the normal direction, and that will tell us what n is, and take the component in the tangential tangent. direction. But the normal and the tangent directions are just not going to be given by these formulas, they're going to be given by something else. And they're going to change in a different way with position. So I think, yeah, you'd, it, it, I think it would be helpful, say, if you're constrained to something, you want to find what's a nice way of parameterizing being on that surface. So if you know that you're on an ellipse, then using some kind of theta is going to be good because there's a single variable that tells you where you are on it, in the same way that theta here tells us where we are on this great circle. Mm. I've never seen a question asking, <laughs> but I mean, in principle, but it's the Just same idea. Theoretically, yeah. It's the same <laughs> idea. The, we tried to do this before with my globe. Oops. I don't know what happened to my ball. The ball is a big marble there. Yeah, the marble might fall off a bit too suddenly. The, whoop. <laughs> the um, where do you think? Well, now we've got these people filming us. We might actually better look at the slow motion. <laughs> to me, it doesn't look like it falls off. It falls off after two thirds of the height. Let's try and catch it. Oh. Yeah, it falls off about here. Yeah, I think it falls off. I, I was quite surprised that it was two thirds the way up. Um, but w but one thing that I did think is that it, so if you if you account for friction, and I think you can argue that it must be a bit further down. Yeah. Um, can you see why I can say that? Because it's going to lose it, some of its energy, so it'll have less energy in the horizontal direction. Uh, so what do you mean by energy in the horizontal direction? As it'll have less velocity in the horizontal direction because it, so it's going to stay on for longer. Uh, I think that's sort of true, but why does that mean it's going to stay on for longer? You mean because, because it's also going to have less energy in, it's going to have yeah. less velocity in all yeah. directions. You're, you're thinking because it's not, but it, it has a force to go that way. It's acceleration due to gravity in the vertical direction, whereas it's going to be like decelerating only in yeah. the horizontal direction. Hmm. I think that's kind of true. I was thinking, so where, where, did, where would a friction force have come into anything that we write down here? In there. Yeah, so I'd, I'd, I'd have another force which is in the e theta direction. Yeah. That would be a frictional force. And so what, what difference would it make to this bit, the energy conservation? What, what could we say about the kinetic energy if we know that there's a friction force? What, how would it compare with this expression? This is kind of what it you're would saying. be less. It would be less, yeah. 
So if, 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 there, if, if there were some friction, then the energy at some later time must be less than what we started with, uh, because we would have had to do some work against the friction. So it would mean that theta dot squared is less than what we get from that expression. And so that would mean, so when you come back and stick that into here, it would mean that n is going to be bigger than what we got from here for any given theta. And so n would be bigger than what it is in the frictionless case always. And so presumably that means we have to go for longer before n reduces to zero. zero. Um, so I think you, I think you could you can see that from from the fact that you're having to subtract off the kinetic energy in, in that. Um, so maybe that's partly why it doesn't look like it leaves quite so quickly. Um, okay, so yeah, the main the, the main thing there is that I think it might be try, try and use er and e theta as much as you can, um, even if you've got to some, be a bit inventive in making up what are the best coordinates. Um, okay, then, but then the third one uh, is was this thing on the wire, and so you made a you made a classical mistake here, um, which everyone makes, uh, which is to say that n has to be perpendicular to r dot. Um, in this particular question, that's not true. Um, is that because of the rotation? Yeah. So we've got this bead sitting on this parabolic wire, and the whole thing's rotating. So which direction is R dot? Is this thing that position R? It's tangent to the parabola. So, it, yeah, this is, this is what's well, it, a bit confusing. It, because so it's, it's moving round as well. Yeah, so, it's so the, the component in this plane is tangent to the parabola, but the whole thing is is rotating. Mm -hmm. So R dot is actually pointing some, it's got some component along the tangent, but it's also got some component into the mm -hmm. page. And, and that's, and, and the normal in this case is, all we, all we know is that it's normal to the wire. We don't know that it's like normal to a plane. Like in question, in question yeah. one, you're on a cone and you know that this normal force is tangent to the plane. In this case, it's a wire. So all we know is that the, the force is tangent is, is perpendicular to the wire, but we don't it could be pointing any direction around the wire and it could in fact it has to have some component into the page as well. And so the dot product with R dot in this case is not zero. Which then means that the energy is not conserved. Because any, that's what we saw on this stuff. Energy conservation is associated there, yeah. with N dot R dot being zero. And that's so. So th that's just why you ended up with a that's, minus yeah. sign that didn't work. So your expression here is conservation of energy, uh, and whereas the expression you're aiming for is actually not conservation of energy. It's something that looks almost like it, <laughs> except that it's it's not quite the same. And so and that's because in this case we're forcing the thing. So we're forcing this wire to go round and round and round, uh, and so we're actually we're, we're doing work yeah. on on the particle in this case. Um, So you avoided this, didn't you? Because you said made a new tangent vector. Yeah. So, that, so the, yeah, the, the, the issue here was that so n. It's quite hard to draw this in. At least if you're like me, I can only draw in two D. So n is going in some direction, which is great. It got a component into the page. So what do you know about n? In this case, the only thing you know is that n is perpendicular to the wire. So I would write that as n dot t is equal to zero, uh, where t t is the tangent to the wire. So you don't know n dot e theta equals zero in this case either. In fact, it's not. Um, there, there is a component that way, um, and so you have you have to work out something to do with the tangent. Uh, vector for the wire, um, which you know is what was the formula for this? Z equals R squared over two a. Um, so, ha ha do you know how I work out a tangent to that? Differentiate it. Yeah. 
So the tangent will be at least proportional to 1 and dz dr, which is r over a, in terms of r and uh, z. So in fact, then I want to write that as e r plus r over a e z. Right, and because we're going to dot with this thing, we, we, we're not, we don't really need to make it a unit normal, in this, or unit tangent. Um, we just need something which is in the right direction. So here I've got ER. I always think it's useful to draw these diagrams and label everything as much as you can. So you don't get confused about the angles. Um, so this, so th this is exactly the right uh, coordinate system to use, and then this stuff is all fine. So the, the, the um, yeah, the part A gave you that one, and so yeah, at this point, I think you need to say I'm going to dot with the tangent. Yeah. Okay. And these questions is always just a case of working out what do you want to dot with, um, to get this to work. And so if you do that, so let's let's just do that because I want to check that we get the right equation. So we've got m r double dot dotted with that tangent is minus m g e z plus n dotted with the tangent. And e z dot t is just minus m g r over a. And n dot t is 0. That's 0. And this thing uh, is there's e r dotted with the r component of that, so it's going to be m r double dot minus r omega squared from that thing, and then e z with the z component, so it's going to be plus r over a z double dot. Goes in there. And then you had to, to do a little bit of work to work out what r dot and z dot were related to each other, which I think you did. Okay, you knew. Um, you have to decide which one you're going to get it all in terms of. But I think if we do all of that, then that tells <laughs> us that thing. Yeah, and it's a, and it's a bit weird. The, the only difference is that, yeah, that, that, that sign. Um, but uh, does that sort of make sense? So, so it's basically because when you start with this, um, so it's minus m g e z plus n. If I actually did my energy kind of argument here and said let's dot it with r dot, then we would get half m r dot squared differentiated. That's what I get from m r dot r double dot. <laughs> is equal to, and then this term would still be minus mgz dot, so we'd still get minus d by dt of mgz, but then I would have plus n dot r dot there. Which is no longer zero. And that term yeah. is, is not zero, and in fact you can kind of work out what it is if you, if you relate it to this equation. Um, so this one is not zero in this case. Um, okay, anyway, so, so you you then did what you should do, which is, you said, let's just ignore the fact that I've got the wrong equation, <laughs> and then go with the equation that they said. Um, oh yeah, you just, you, you were using dots, when I think, it just because, yeah. I think it just gets a bit confusing if you start putting dots in there. Um, There's so many dots in this sheet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so we, we don't just write numbers next to each other. That means yeah. multiplication. That's not a problem. Um, or write letters next to each other. Huh? Um, so, and, and then, th then we had this thing about stability. Um, so first of all, do you know where this equation comes from? The Taylor expansion. The Taylor expansion of? The previous equation. This one. Can you show me how that works? <laughs> <laughs> it comes from... We're Taylor expanding 
the equation for r, right? Yeah. The, re the reason I'm asking is because it's not totally the, like, it's not the yeah. standard form yeah. that you see these things in. You're probably used to seeing something like r double dot is f of r. Yeah. And then, so what would be the definition of an equilibrium point in that case? When that is zero, when f is zero, and r is a constant. So if we call it a, so an equilibrium point is just a constant solution of the equation. So you, it, r equals a, um, it's just any point that satisfies f of a is zero. And then if you want to analyze the stability, what do you do? You say, you say let r be a plus a small perturbation. And for some reason, we always call a small perturbation psi, even though you all hate writing psi. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's a very difficult <laughs> character to write. Yeah, I think it's easy. You just write it. <laughs> yeah, um, and, but you assume that psi is small. That's the whole point of it. Yeah. That's why it's called linearizing. And you plug that in. And so then you get, because a is a constant, you get psi double dot is f of a plus psi. And then that's what you tailor expand that. And that gives you f of a, which is zero by definition of a, plus f primed of a times psi. And then you ignore the higher order terms. Higher order terms. And so you just end up with psi double dot is f primed of a psi. And then that's an equation that has either trigonometric or exponential mm -hmm. solutions. Um, if, and I made a comment here that I think, I think you need to explain a little bit more about why the sign of this term then mean, determines the stability. Um, so it's unstable for the exponential solution because... Yeah, why? why, why it grows it? exponentially. <laughs> yeah, if, I mean, the, the question is just, if I make a small perturbation like this, does yeah. psi grow? Or not, and and so it's unstable if the solutions are exponentially growing, um, and it, and it, for for this particular equation, you always get solutions which are either trigonometric or exponential, and if they're exponential, one of the exponentials might decay. But for the other one, um, well, if, if it's this equation exactly, yeah. then one of them will decay, and one of them, but one of them will grow, and if there's any component of the solution which grows, then it means it's unstable. So I think what you should always write when you get that kind of thing. So so you had psi double dot is was it a omega squared minus g a, or do we lose? No, we lost the a's. Omega squared minus g over a psi. You, what you should write is just that omega squared is bigger than g over a. It means that term is positive, so it means my solutions are trigonometric. Uh, sorry, that, that means they're exponential. But I would say that I get exponential solutions. And then that means it's unstable. But I would write that rather than just saying that means it's unstable because yeah. that, that gives me no explanation as to why. <laughs> if you just say this is bigger than this means it's unstable, I don't understand why. Um, but whereas if omega squared is less than g over a, I get trig solutions. So psi just oscillates. So it means if I perturb it by a small amount, it will just it will stay close by. And so that means it's it's stable. Um, okay, but, but so just to go back to this, so, so we didn't really quite have this. We had something that actually looks a little bit more complicated because we've got all this kind of funny stuff on the left-hand side is equal to this. So, it does, so there isn't, it's not really obvious what f is. Well, in fact, this is not an equation of that form because you can rearrange it, but you'll still have r double dot as a function of r and r dot squared. So the... Uh, it's more complicated, but still you're doing the same. You're basically doing the same thing, um, and so in this case we said r equals zero is an equilibrium, and then so we say that r equals psi is going to be small as a small perturbation from zero, and then that means that you can ignore anything which is more than linear in psi. So you're putting in r equals psi, so you almost could just leave it as r, but you can just then ignore anything which is squared or higher. Yeah, squared or higher, and in fact there isn't anything squared, but there's two cubic terms. So you've got an r squared, r double dot, and you've got an r r dot squared, 
And you're always when you say when you say xi is small, you're always assuming its derivatives are small as well. Um, so then you so you then you say I linearize, meaning I just keep it turns up toward a xi, and then so you just end up with a squared xi double dot is a squared m with the squared minus g a xi, which is why can we assume that its derivatives are also small? So that's it's an assumption that you would then you would then check. Okay. Um, so you you were as long as psi itself is sufficiently small, then um, the solutions of this, at least for small time, will be small, and their derivatives will also be small. Okay. So 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 you you do this, you find a solution, and then you can check that it's consistent to say that the derivatives of that solution were small and therefore you were okay to assume that they were small in the first place. <laughs> it's like a consistency. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a bit like, I mean, we often do that when we're solving differential equations where we don't, we don't deduce the solution. Yeah. We say, let me guess the solution yeah. and then I find that it works yeah. and then I rely upon someone else who's proven that there is only <laughs> one solution and that, that allows me to do that. Um, um, for discussing the stability, do we also talk about the case where they are equal? I think you don't need to, to talk about that. Um, I don't think you ever expected to look okay. at what happens there, because because you then need, need to look at the higher order mm -hmm. terms. So that then becomes a nonlinear calculation. So you I don't think you would ever be. We're not at that level. That. So you, you you just do the two cases either side, and don't worry about the intermediate one. Mm -hmm. What, what, so what, what happens in this case if it's unstable? So it, it, that means it's rotating fast enough, right? If omega, omega is big enough, that means the thing's rotating fast enough. So what, what would happen? Maybe it's going to move up. up. Yeah. And keep going up for a while. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So the, the, because the, there's actually only, that's the only equilibrium solution here. So it, if, if it's unstable, then... It's just going to keep going out and out and out. It's going to get faster and faster, and it's going to get higher and higher up the wire. And that's kind of showing you the fact that energy can't be conserved, because because actually the limit of this is that the thing would go off to infinity. Um, and that's because you're pumping energy into the system all the time. And that's that's associated with the fact that this n has got this component in the direction that the thing's moving. Um, so you don't you definitely we're not going to get that here, right, where. The fact that energy is conserved means it can't get it can't get that high. Um, okay, right. So we've done all of that. So let me just spend a few minutes on the PDE stuff. Um, yeah. uh, so the first question there was deriving a wave equation. Um, and I think I just wanted to say something about that bit. Oh yeah, it was about the dimension. Of, so, so this bit was not quite right because you, you, I think you just forgot to get rid of that when you differentiated with respect to time. So because this this equation would would slightly alarm me uh, because you've got all these components yeah, yeah. in the j direction and then you've got yeah. an isolated one in the i direction. So you were fine to do that, but it would be. It should be that, that yeah. shouldn't be it shouldn't be there, but yeah, this um, non-dimensionalization that you had to do. I seem to have lost my sheet. Is it? Is it? Um these alpha and beta that you had to come up with, which were the, the non-dimensional equivalents of gravity and area distance. And it said, what's, what's the conditions under which they are negligible? Um, so what it wanted you to say there was that alpha and beta would need to be small. Then you could ignore them. Uh, so did you have to go into detail about the physical uh, implications of alpha and beta being small? Or like? No, no, it just wants you to, to say that. alpha and beta okay. small. Because you, you then sort of tried to convert that back into yeah. saying something else. But the, and this is precisely why you do non-dimensionalization, because you've now written something that doesn't make sense. 
because this is a acceleration and this is a speed and this has got some other funny units I remember what the units of yeah. gamma are um, but it doesn't make sense okay, to yeah, say sense. Yeah. an acceleration is less than the speed yeah, yeah. because I mean it's like saying well, I don't know, it's, like, it's like saying I weigh less than your height it doesn't make any sense um, so but so what you actually mean there is to say gravity is small and yeah. this alpha is kind of telling you what that what it would mean to say that gravity is small because it, you're comparing gravity to something else uh, so in this case you're comparing it to some other force which is to do with the tension um, um, so that how that happens could be in a number of different ways I can't remember what alpha was was it alpha was G L squared over H C squared, C squared but, but C squared C is, is T on rho. Yeah. So rho G L squared over H T is the sort of is the dimensionless measure of how large gravity is. So you could you could have gravity not being important because the string is very short, having L be very small. Or you could have it not be important because tension is really large. So if I pull really if I've got a big long string it might weigh quite a lot, but if I, if I make the tension large enough, if I pull it really taut, then gravity becomes irrelevant, even though it might weigh quite a lot. So rho g l might be quite big, that's the weight of the string, but if the tension is big enough, that doesn't matter for the, for the way that the equation works. So this is kind of telling you how to, how to say that gravity is not important. Um, I've just completely ignored it from one word. <laughs> yeah, you, you lost the gamma. Yes. But then, and then I, but then, so then I didn't quite understand how that could work because I don't think gamma I mean, is gamma dimensional. Was the, but then, but that, then actually, this, but this, this doesn't work. So gamma <laughs> is whatever makes that work. <laughs> how did you work out the dimensions of gamma? For me? Um, so they said that this is force per unit length. So ah. I worked out the dimensions of that, and then we know what the dimension of that is, so then we must have that for the dimension of gamma. Right, so you, this has got to be a force per unit length, yeah. so then I can work out what gamma needs to be. Does that make sense, Craig? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it, even if it's not said that, you can look at this equation and say, well, I know I'm putting this term together with this term, so these terms must have the same yeah. dimension, so gamma RT needs to have the same dimensions as RGJ, I don't know. J is just a unit vector, so it's just rho G. Um, so if, if you don't know the units of something, that, that would be kind of how you can work them out. Just by making everything work. Um, then I think... Yeah, so you plotted the wrong bits, these graphs. So if you are told that f of x is zero for mod x, bigger than L, it doesn't matter what F is, but for between L and minus L, it's definitely zero. Then what can you say about mod of F of X minus CT? Yeah, this is what I thought originally, you just translated it, and then I think I was convinced otherwise. Yeah, but I think it was because of this thing. That you, so, so you know that F of X minus C, that just means put in yeah, X minus CT into F. So you know that this has got to be 0 for x minus ct bigger than l. So that this is the argument of the function, so it goes in there. And so when you plot this as a function of x, uh, then it's the region between ct, ct plus l, and ct minus l is the region where it might not be 0, and the, it's got to be 0 everywhere else. Yeah. And so in that question, you had this, this thing, which was this funny shape. Uh, that fits in like that. Um, yeah, I, I can see you rubbed it out, <laughs> and then you changed your mind. But but yeah, sometimes these things are, you just have to be almost like a computer. You've got to say, well, f is a function which takes this argument. So if I put in a different argument, I've just got to replace that argument everywhere in my expression, uh, and to be really systematic about that. Right, I think we we may be out of time. Um, the last question was okay. I made some comments uh, about the the end part of it, um, and I think calculating the coefficients went not quite right. Yeah. Too. But I'm not too fussed about getting the integrals wrong. Um, 
Oh yeah, there was this this last part. So, so, so it said, it said, can you break down this function into um, two functions? Can you tell me what these functions are? And you found what they were in terms of some Fourier coefficients. Mm -hmm. but can you tell me what those functions are? What what, what were the definition of the a n in terms of part a? This was a very long question. It was a long question. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, but do you remember where the Fourier coefficient came from in the, in the thing? Okay, that so h of x is f of x, I think. It's almost. Almost. So, uh, f, yeah. Where is f of x defined? For x within L, minus L to L or something? Just yeah, zero to L. No. Less than zero. No, just zero to just L. Zero to L. So we we were only ever given anything on this fixed domain between zero and L. And so at this point, when you've tried to apply the initial conditions to the problem, you said, I need to try and find some an such that f of x is the sum of the an's sine. And so your thinking at that point okay. is to say, well, yeah. I I know because we were taught this at the start of term, <laughs> I know how to choose an such that that is the case. Those ans are going to be the Fourier sine coefficients of f, uh, and then you do the same thing with this one. You you say, well, I need the the derivative to be g, and the derivative is this, so I need to choose these coefficients to be the Fourier sine coefficients of the g, um, and the function that you're then creating when you do the sum of the an sines is then an extension of the f because you made it periodic. And which extension is it if you make it a sine series? Odd, odd extension, which is? It's the, it's the odd extension yeah. of f. That's yeah, so where you're, you're doing on, on minus l to zero, you flipped it over. Um, so, so these functions that you ended up with at the end is h of x and u of x. So h of x is the odd extension of f, and u of x is the odd extension of g. So they're, they're related to the initial conditions. Um, and then that actually kind of goes back to question two there, because yeah. the, the way that you can think of these things is that the initial shape splits in two and then moves sideways. Mm -hmm. And in this case, we have boundaries, but the boundaries are kind of uh, reflecting and they're allowing the, the same wave to come back in again upside down. And so this, okay. this is saying that actually you can think of the solution that you end up with by this method is kind of in the same framework as the, the, the solution that you had here, even though it looks very different. <laughs> okay, right. Anyway, that, that's enough. So next week we might concentrate a bit more on the, this stuff and not the dynamics. But, um, okay.